the most important, I believe, job that a parent has is to emotionally support their son or their daughter. So when I think about emotional support in that sense, I think about trying to get behind the behavior that they're exhibiting to see what's driving that behavior. Because most times we act on the basis of a feeling that we have. So if your teenager is feeling very hurt, very disconnected, very uh, isolated, whatever it might be, they may well be running and not wanting to connect with you either. But instead, what happens is that they keep shutting you out. You feel hurt when they shut you out. You react angrily. They get angry. You get angry. And it just cycles, and it becomes this huge, big, negative spiral, uh, which becomes very destructive for your relationship with them. So what your task is is to try to turn that around a little bit, see past the behavior. Don't just assume that just because they're shouting and roaring at you that they really are angry with you or that they even do, as they may say, hate you. They don't hate you. But what they're trying to express in that moment is that they really feel bad about something that's going on. And it may be the quality of their relationship with you, but it might not be either. So when we think about emotional support, what we're really trying to help our teenagers to achieve is what I would consider emotional congruence. Okay? So that's where you have a feeling that fits with the event that has occurred. Once you have emotional congruence, you can actually process and deal with the feeling. If you can connect the appropriate feeling to the event and really feel what that feeling was about, then you won't necessarily be hampered by that feeling all through your life. But because the feelings that we're trying to connect to are often very painful, it's too hard sometimes to connect them and we need the support of other people. So I'm going to give you an example of emotional congruence and also emotional discrepancy. So in the first instance, I'm going to talk about emotional discrepancy. I'm not going to use a teenage example, but I'm going to use an example of a four-year-old child who's going to come into you. So you're busy doing your work, and uh, your little boy comes in, uh, and he's fallen over outside, and he's got a little graze on his knee. Okay, not a huge cut. Small graze, perhaps the odd little drop of blood appearing. Okay, but for him, he's coming in and going, Oh, my, my leg, it's so sore, oh, my leg. And you look at the leg, and you're busy, and you go, you're fine, you're fine, good lad, off you go, you're grand, you're grand, good. there's nothing wrong with you, go on, it's a scratch, go on, off you go. Now in that moment, what will happen for your son is that he will experience emotional discrepancy or incongruence, okay? He has a feeling of soreness, okay, perhaps a little bit exaggerated, but a feeling of soreness nonetheless, okay? And he comes in to tell you about this feeling of soreness, to check it out with you, hopefully to get a bit of comfort, and instead you turn around and tell him, you're fine, okay? Now in that moment, there's no match between the feeling he has and what he is being helped to understand about that feeling. He's in fact being told you're okay even though he doesn't feel okay. So that's emotional discrepancy. And what I'm suggesting to you is that what you really want to offer is emotional congruence, emotional connection. What will happen then, so he has this feeling of soreness, he's told he's fine, he will just go off whinging and whining out the door. Oh, no, it's, it's really, really sore. Oh. You know, and off he goes, okay, and he'll probably sit on the back step and he'll continue to cry and moan for about five or ten minutes or longer even until you call them all in for dinner. At which point you go, come here, look, let's get a plaster, you're all right, you'll be fine, you'll be fine, okay, and eventually he'll calm down. But for those ten minutes, while he was sitting on that step, he couldn't make sense of this sore feeling that he had because he had been told he was all right. The same youngster comes in, same, oh, my knee, oh, it's so sore, oh, oh, and you turn around, you go, oh, my, oh, yep, oh, look at your knee, oh, that looks really sore, okay? Now, in that moment, he is going to experience emotional congruence, because his knee feels sore, and you tell him, oh, that looks really sore, and so he goes, okay, it's sore, oh, my God, it's sore, and he will wail, okay? So he will howl for Ireland, I'll guarantee it. He will really let loose. But what's happening in that moment, because the emotional congruence is there, he is feeling the feeling truly and fully and expressing it truly and fully, and then it's gone. So he might last with that for a minute or so. Then he'll have to draw breath, which is a good thing for parents. And in that moment, when he draws breath, you'll go, you poor wee thing, will we get one of Granny's special plasters? You know the ones she left here the last time? They're fantastic, aren't they? Will that help the pain to go away? <gasps> I, I don't know, oh, I don't know. And they hold up your knee and you go and get the plaster, and you put the plaster on and they go, thanks. <laughs> okay? He's not gonna go and sit out in the step in the back. He's gonna go straight back outside, probably to his sister and go, I got one of Granny's special plasters and you didn't, all right? 
but he's dealt with the feeling, okay? In that moment of emotional congruence, the fit was there between the feeling he had and what he was being told and helped to understand about that experience. And so he was able to deal with it and move on from it. That's what we're trying to do with our teenagers. It's not as easy with a teenager because the feelings aren't as straightforward, the events aren't as straightforward, and you mightn't even know what the true events are. And so that's why what you're trying to do in those moments is to make suggestions. And this comes back to making statements rather than uh, asking questions. So rather than saying, what's wrong? Are you depressed? I don't know. It's saying, you know, you seem so glum for such a long time. It must be awful for you. And so in that moment, okay, you're not necessarily telling your child what they're feeling, but you are making suggestions to them about what you think they might be feeling. And that's all your task is, is to try to cast the net wide. So you say things like, I wonder if you feel, or it seems to me that, or it looks like you are, or I wonder if, all those kinds of statements which suggest possibility as opposed to definition. If you say to your child, you're angry, that's what you are they'll go, oh, if I'm right, I'm angry, and they'll give you lots more of it, okay? Whereas if you say, well, look, you seem really cross right now, and because you're so cross, I'm guessing we're not going to progress much further in this discussion, so we're going to hold back, okay? We'll come back to this another time when you're feeling less cross and I'm feeling less cross. And so you walk away. And that's what we're trying to do all the time, is just to try to make that connection to the emotional world of your child. Because if you can make that connection, I can almost guarantee you will begin to take a lot of the intensity out of their interactions with you, particularly where those are negative interactions. And also you'll be helping them to make better sense of their world, which will make them healthier and happier individuals in the longer run.